Well, good morning, church family. As I say always on a Sunday morning, uh, it's great to see you here. I sincerely mean that. Uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord to worship together. Let's stand as we sing and worship our good and gracious King. I approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance. From a good and gracious King, I will give to you my burden as you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit as I sing to you. Praise. You deserve the great 
Jesus powerful, eternal King, you will reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name, be lifted high for all the world to see, your name is all they need, your name is all we need, eternal continue in our time of worship and give you a little break to sit uh, for a moment. Uh, Wednesday evening, the church met in uh, a quarterly members meeting, which ended up being half year late, but uh, we had a members meeting on Wednesday, and in that members meeting, the church affirmed uh, Emily Tuzzi on a mission journey that she's going to be taking over the next year, and uh, so I asked her this morning if she would share uh, for those of you who weren't here to hear what she'll be doing. And uh, then uh, when she is done sharing, she's going to sing the first verse of Holy, Holy, Holy to us in Japanese, which is going to make sense in a moment when you hear her uh, testimony what she's going to be doing. So Emily, share with us. Minasan, ohayou gozaimasu. Good morning, church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily Tuzi. I've been a member here for uh, about two years, and I've been blessed to be a part of the music ministry through um, the choir and praise team. So an important part of my background is that I have an American father and a Japanese mother. Growing up, I struggled with identity issues, especially while I was living in Japan um, from the ages of about eight to 13. Am I Japanese? Am I American? Can I be both or am I neither living in this strange limbo as a third culture kid, never truly belonging in either culture? I became bitter and angry at God um, for these struggles and while I was uh, being forced to live in Japan. Um, fast forward a bit, and I attended Liberty University initially as a computer science major, but strangely felt called to switch even though I was over halfway through my degree. I'm happy to say that I've successfully graduated this past May with a BM in choral music education. Now, by the time I started at Liberty, I'd already repented of my anger and bitterness toward the Lord during those childhood tween years I lived in Japan. Um, however, I was still holding some resentment um, towards Japan because of my negative experiences. But throughout my time at Liberty, God slowly softened my heart, and I began to feel more pain, not for myself, but for the Japanese people. Um, next slide, please. So um, as you can see, most Japanese claim to practice Buddhism or Shinto, but it is actually very surface level. They do the rituals and events because their family or community participates in it and not because they truly believe. In fact, many Japanese, especially among young people, um, are agnostic or atheist, um, as my own mother once was before she came to Christ. The 1.5% of Christianity on there includes all sects, such as Catholicism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, and so on. Um, Protestantism is probably like 0.5%. Um, and uh, another thing is uh, mental 
uh, health with almost 25% of people having considered suicide at least one time in their lives. And despite these higher rates of mental illness, um, mental health services are not well known or accepted in the country. Um, discussing mental illness is very taboo, leading many um, who do truly need that help into further depression, anxiety, and even death. So my change of heart towards Japan, combined with my degree in education, led me to search for opportunities to teach in Japan. Um, and this led me to Okinawa Christian School International, or OCSI. They are an accredited pre-K through 12 international school in Okinawa, Japan, which is where a lot of the military bases are, um, if you're familiar. Um, and the curriculum is American-based, so they start school in August. Um, there are over 500 students consisting of native Japanese students, military kids, missionary kids, uh, children of businessmen and women, and mixed students such as myself. Um, I will be working as the music teacher for all grades and be in charge of organizing school performances. I'm contracted for one year, but I might stay longer depending on what the Lord uh, ha wants me to do. So um, I hope to reach and minister to the students, especially those who may be struggling with identity, culture issues, mental illness, and perhaps even lead some to Christ. Because just because a student attends a Christian school doesn't mean that they or their family are believers. Um, though I know the culture and language fairly well, I'm still in a sense starting fresh because Okinawa is about a two or three hour flight from where I used to live um, during my childhood years. All of my mother's family, the former church I went to, and all my old friends will know, be nowhere near my placement, and so it's kind of a, still a d big uh, leap of faith for me. I found OCSI and the teaching position through an organization called Teach Beyond, and I'll be going um, to OCSI through them as well. Their motto is transformational education. And they believe that education is an effective catalyst bringing hope to individuals and positive transformation to communities. They know that education is valued in nearly um, every country and culture in the world. And so it is through education that they seek to reach students, families, and communities for Christ. I could go on and on about this amazing opportunity and how God has shown himself throughout this whole process. Um, and I would love to speak to you after the service. I'm back by the Welcome Center, um, but considering everything going on, I understand, you know, if you don't want to stay to talk too much. But I do have prayer cards and a newsletter sign-up sheet, so please feel free to sign up or take a card. Um, I would truly be grateful as for if Forest Baptist Church would pray for me in this great journey I'm about to begin, um, especially in light of the pandemic situation. Prayers for me and my emotional and spiritual well-being since I will be away from my friends and family um, here in the U.S. and re-experiencing culture shock when I get to Okinawa. Prayers that I will perform well in this ministry, especially since I'm a first-year teacher straight out of college. Um, prayers for my future students, co-workers, and administration at OCSI. And finally, please pray that I will quickly find a local church family that God wants me to be a part of during my time there in Okinawa. Let's stand as we continue to worship and as Amoy sings for us. <clears throat> Say 
church family. Uh, my name is Mark Hernandez. I am a newly uh, affirmed elder by the congregation as of this week, so I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the confidence and trust of the congregation. Grace of God to have me here. I'm really uh, pleased to serve uh, here uh, with this elder team, and uh, may the, the Lord give us a uh, uh, continued fruitful season of ministry together. So uh, our reading from this morning is from uh, James uh, 2, chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 to 13. So James is at the back of your New Testament. Uh, flip to the back there after the book of Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. So we're James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Uh, so beginning 2, verse 1. Uh, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dress in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, uh, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brothers, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law of scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become, become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. May this the word of God go forth and accomplish in us and for him what he so desires. Well, amen. Thank you, Brother Mark, for leading us in prayer this morning. Well, I trust your Bibles are still open to the book of James. As we just read a moment ago, we're looking at James chapter 2, verses 1 uh, through 13 this morning. <clears throat> On March 8, 1961, Forest Baptist Church held a monthly business meeting. After the treasurer's report, there came a few items of business. The church voted to pay down the building debt with an extra year of payments at a total cost of $679. The church also voted to form a committee to oversee some much-needed repairs. And then the minutes record these shocking words. Quote, The church voted that the ushers be informed to seat any colored visitors at our church at the back." End quote. Listen to that again. The church voted that the ushers be informed to seat any colored visitors at our church at the back. The last line of the minutes then read, the meeting was adjourned with prayer. What kind of prayer does a church pray after openly agreeing together to sin? I have no idea. I wrestled all week with whether to begin with that opening and bit of history, but I obviously decided to do it, so let me say just a few remarks. First of all, there's no member of our church alive who was part of that vote then. And I'm not sharing it to indict us for what a former generation did. The history of the SBC and of our SBC churches is no secret. 
though we treated it as a secret for too long. And we certainly have a duty to denounce such racism as evil and yet recognize just how close to home it was. Furthermore, I have no reason to think that anyone in our church would support such an evil motion today. In fact, over the past 21 years that I've been here, I've only seen our actions speak louder than those words. We have rightly and repeatedly defied the spirit of that motion in our missions and membership and leadership. And by the way, if there is any such person who so happens to be here that would vote in favor of that motion, let me be clear, you have two options, repent or leave. So why do I share that shameful event in our history? I share it because I've asked myself a question all week as I've read our passage. And that question is this. I wonder if it would have made any difference on that Wednesday night in 1961 if someone had had the courage to stand up and simply read James 2, 1 through 13. This passage is proof that what the church did in that vote was a brazen violation of Scripture. And I despise the fact that it's in our church's history. But since it's there, we need to recognize it for the evil that it was and is and make sure that we never come close to committing that same sin again, not in this way or in any other way. And that's not just my opinion. That is the message of James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. In this passage, we are commanded very clearly by God to avoid favoritism, to shun partiality of every kind. And James is going to show us that that kind of favoritism, that kind of discrimination is not just offensive to a group of people, but it is supremely offensive to our God and to everything that His gospel stands for. And James will show us why favoritism and why prejudice is such a wicked, wicked sin. In this passage that we have before us, James is going to cram a a lot into this. So if you're taking notes, get ready. James is is going to pack in here seven reasons why we should avoid the sin of favoritism. Seven reasons why favoritism and prejudice is a wicked, wicked sin. First of all, James tells us in verse 1 that favoritism is a sin against Christ. It is a sin against Christ. Verse 1 is the main command. It is the the doorway you have to go through to get to the rest of the text. And notice what he says in verse 1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. James is clear right off the bat. Favoritism and faith cannot go together. If you love Jesus, he says, you will love everyone that you encounter. And if you don't love everyone you encounter, then you don't love Jesus as you should. He says in verse 1 and speaks of an attitude of personal favoritism. Some of your Bibles use the word partiality. Some say respecter of persons. I even found one translation that used the word snobbery. But the word can be literally translated to receive someone according to their face. In other words, it means to to, to treat people differently because of their appearance, because of what you see. It's what today we would call prejudice or discrimination. Now, some people would be quick to say, well, wait a minute, James is going to talk about the rich and the poor. Yes, that is the example he's going to use, but if you notice, the command of verse 1 is open-ended. There is nothing in verse 1 specifically about rich and poor. He is prohibiting all forms of bias. In fact, the command here is plural. There's a no place for any kind of favoritism, James says. And why is it forbidden? Because he says in verse 1, because of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. James says that prejudice is an offense to the glory and the lordship of Jesus. The word glory includes the idea of weight or importance. If you read it in the Scriptures, that's kind of the idea that it has. 
What, what's favoritism? Favoritism is acting as if one person or one group of people is more important than another. It's giving that sense of importance. And James says, by showing favoritism, you're glorifying the wrong person. James is saying we should look at others understanding first and foremost the glory of Christ. And so if Christ is most important, then we will treat others as equally important. James says the best way to honor Christ is to honor everyone. And to show partiality, to hold to such a prejudice is, is literally anti-Christ. It is the opposite of how Jesus was. In Luke chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus' own opponents recognized this. They said to him, quote, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly and that you are not partial to any. That was the way of Jesus, and that is to always be the way of Jesus' people. He ministered and equally and lovingly to everyone, men, women, boys, girls, Jews, Gentiles, slave, free, sick, healthy, rich, poor, the list goes on and on. And James says here in verse 1, if you dishonor anyone out of personal favoritism, you are dishonoring the glory of the Lord Jesus. Favoritism is a sin against Christ. Number two, he says, favoritism is a sin against the church. It is also a sin against the church. He get, dives into a specific example. Notice verse 2, he says, for if a man comes into your assembly, your sunagoge, your, your actual worship service, with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. Now, we'll just pause there for a moment. James envisions two men walking into church. And I think from the context, it's pretty obvious they're visitors because they don't know where to sit. They walk into the service and they look very different. The first man is obviously rich. My kids were very amused when I told them, the, it says here in verse 2, that the rich man literally has gold fingers. It, it's literally, his jewelry's dripping off of him, is what it means. He's wearing a silky, luxurious robe. In my mind, he looks like Liberace. I don't know if that's what you see, but, you know, just, just obviously wealthy. The second man, however, walks in and he looks homeless. He's, he's clothed in dirt, verse 2 says. You can imagine the rich man probably smells good. The, the poor man probably is putrid. And based purely on that appearance, based purely on what the eye could see, the Christians have a knee-jerk response. Verse two, 3, he says, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or you sit by my footstool. If you can't see why I chose that opening note, you now can see it. They were literally seating people in different places because of their appearance. James says you showed VIP treatment to the one guy because you thought that, that he was rich and could do something for you, and the other guy, you said, you just sit in the back. You just sit in the floor. He says that is the sin of favoritism. Favoritism and prejudice reduces people purely to their externals. And we begin to see others as dollar signs or we assume they're troublemakers or as more important or less important because of what we perceive and we stop seeing people as those who are whole persons made in the image of God. We're all tempted to do this. I mean, just imagine if we were sitting here and walked in, then all of a sudden walked into the service, there was... A Jeff Bezos, right? Or a Elon Musk, somebody we know that's rich. Some of you would be reaching for a business card, right? Wanting to just get it in his hand. The thought of making that network, making that connection, it would be, even in church, it would be so tempting for some. Or if a person walked in with a, a t-shirt that endorsed a product you didn't like, or maybe a, a politician you disagree with, what would your gut reaction be? To avoid them? To, to lean over and say, can you believe what she's wearing? Who does she think she is? Or would it be to, to introduce yourself? I know some of you would do that. For others, it'd be hard. James says it's because all of us are tempted towards this. Now to be clear, James is not saying the rich are automatically bad. Bad. 
and the poor are automatically good. The Bible is very clear. God's against both discrimination and reverse discrimination. Leviticus 19.15 says, quote, You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great. James is not saying here that what you should have done is pamper the poor guy and ignore the rich guy. No, he says you should have treated them equally, not with favoritism. And why is this a problem? Verse 4, he says, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? The answer to his question is, is obviously what? Yes! The moment you start to make such evaluations and distinctions, you have proved the, the greed or the selfishness or the bias of your own heart. When you make such distinctions, he says, in the church, it is the opposite of everything that the gospel stands for. The unlikely power of the gospel is that it is to bring people together who wouldn't ordinarily and naturally hang out with each other. As D.A. Carson says, what binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything of the sort. What binds us together is Christ. And James says, in the church, when we treat people differently, we are making distinctions that the church is not to make. It is a sin against the church. James goes on and says, number three, it's also a sin against God. It's a sin against God. James invites us to lean in a little bit more. Notice in verse 5, he says, listen, my beloved brethren. James says, I want you to think about what I'm saying. I want you to really think about this. He says, zoom in on what I'm saying here. He's saying, when we show favoritism, our behavior actually becomes the opposite of God's own behavior. He says in verse 5, Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? Again, notice it's a question. And what's the answer to the question? It's an obvious and an emphatic yes. God did choose the poor. Who did choose those that, that had nothing to receive everything. God, God did has worked in this way throughout history. God does not run a credit check on people before they come into the kingdom. God is not looking at our transcripts. He's not looking at our resumes or our background check. He's not impressed by that stuff. God is not one who takes bribes, and the church should not be either. His kingdom includes, yes, some who are rich, but according to verse 5, it includes a lot who are not rich, who are poor and needy and marginalized and outcast, and yet they are the ones that He has called unto himself. He says God chose them. He elected them, is what verse 5 says. Now, to be clear, James is not saying that God only chose the poor. He's saying in verse 5 that God definitely chose the poor, which means if God definitely included the outcast and the marginalized into his plan, then he's saying that we should definitely include them in our plan and in our ministries and in our worship and in every aspect that we can. It mirrors the work of God. I think what James is saying here is uh, along the same lines as Paul in 1 Corinthians 1. Remember what Paul said, he said, quote, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise and not many mighty and not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish and the weak and the base. Now, Paul doesn't say there's not any. What did he say? There's not many. There was a wealthy aristocrat who was saved under the preaching of George Whitfield, very rich uh, baroness, I think was her title, a lady something, I forget her last name. And she used to refer to that verse in 1 Corinthians when she talked to Whitfield and to others, and she would say, I was saved by the letter M. That Paul doesn't say not any, he just says not many. And she said, I was one of those few, I was one of the, the not many noble. And James is saying here, that's his point. If that's how God operates, then that's how we should operate. We should take our cues from Him. Israel was not rich or mighty as a nation, but God chose them to be the recipients of His grace and His word and His Son. The Virgin Mary was not rich or important by the world's standards, but God came to her and chose her to bring her, His Son into the world. 
And so God is saying here, or James is saying here, if God elects the poor and promises to bless them and to do this work, then we need to make sure that we act like God. And when we make such distinctions, our actions are not godly. His point is they're actually ungodly. Rather, he says, we should look at the rich and the poor as being recipients of God's grace. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter was first confronted with the reality of Gentiles coming into the church, which was largely Jewish by that point, Peter was very skeptical. Peter didn't know what to do with this, and God had to send messengers and dreams to convince him of this. And eventually, in Acts chapter 10, Peter says, quote, I most certainly now understand that God is not one to show partiality. Paul in Romans 2.11, For there is no partiality with God. The good news of the gospel is that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That is how God has operated in past, and it's how God operates now, and it's how His people should operate as well. We are to reflect the character, the nature of God. James says it's sin against Christ, sin against the church, it's sin against God. Next, he says it's sin against your neighbor. Verses 6 and 7, it's a sin against neighbor. Notice verse 6, he says, But you have dishonored the poor man. Now, the first century was a, a different, slightly different culture than what many of us have experienced here. Those of you who've lived overseas or lived particularly in Asia, you know that there are parts of the world where culture uh, decisions are often not made as we think of like right and wrong, but the culture can be what's called a shame and honor culture. That's what was happening here in the first century. And, and so the issue isn't so much as we would think of right and wrong. The idea of right and wrong is determined by what honors or dishonors your family or your friends or your community or, or those around you. And James is, is playing on that in verse 6, and he says to them, shame on you for shaming the poor. By pampering the rich guy and telling the poor guy to sit on the floor, you have humiliated him. And he says, you've done the very thing that, that you wouldn't want others to do to you, he says. James says the church should be focused on evangelizing, not embarrassing people. And when we make such distinctions, he says, that's exactly what you have done. Again, this is not just simply an issue of being unkind. Proverbs 17.5 says, Those who mock the poor show contempt for their Maker. He says, you've, you've sinned against God as you've sinned against your neighbor. And if that wasn't enough, notice the rest of verse 6. He says, Is not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? James is saying what you're doing here, it's not only wrong theologically, he says it's also wrong logically. It's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. Why are you trying to impress those who oppress you? The, the same people that you're trying to buddy up to are the ones who largely, he says, are going to turn around and take advantage of you when given the opportunity. Now again, the problem here is not their riches. If anything, the problem is their actions. Notice what he describes in those verses. He speaks that they oppress you. Verse 6, they drag you into court. Verse 7, they blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called. He says the rich act as if they can do whatever they want, that they can trample over those that they want because their money and their power and status has gone to their head and they don't think twice about hurting others. And he says, and that's who you think you want to be friends with? We should think about it. How often do we give our money to support celebrities or musicians or actors who despise everything that we stand for, or politicians who ex would exploit the church for a few votes, or companies who would outspokenly be against the church and her values. Now, I'm not calling for boycotts, and I'm not calling from a withdrawal from society. I'm calling us to think about what James is saying. Do we really want to play the world's game according to the world's rules? Or should we play and live according to God's rules? He says those that show favoritism, they're sinning against their neighbor. Verse 80 says they're also sinning against love. They're sinning also against love. So James has argued theologically, 
and then he's argued rationally, and now he's going to argue biblically. Notice verse 8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. When James refers to the royal law, it could literally mean the king's rule. The, the, it's the same word from which we get the word kingdom. So he says this is the expectation of the kingdom. This is what kingdom living looks like. It's not by the world standards. It's a, it's a different kind of kingdom expectation of how we live. He says this is the highest and supreme expectation that our king has for us, and that's simple, that you love your neighbor as yourself. This is no surprise. Jesus was asked, what are the greatest commandments? What does he say? Love God. Love your neighbor. Now you say, wait a minute, why does he not talk about loving God? James is assuming that people love God, that are listening to him. He's going to talk about that in the next section, about the role of faith. He's assuming that it's these people, it's, it's those of us who claim to love God. He's saying, all right, let, let's stop and have a litmus test. Let's look at the love of neighbor. He says that's the simple command. Love your neighbor as yourself. James says the problem of favoritism is a problem of love. So often prejudice comes from a heart that has too little love for others and too much love for yourself. It's not thinking about the interests of others. It's thinking about your own interests and your own ideas. The question, of course, is often asked, well, who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus made that clear. What did the Good Samaritan tell us? Everybody's your neighbor. So if everyone is your neighbor, then everyone should be loved as your neighbor. Our doctrinal statement, the Baptist Faith and Message in Article 3, it says this, quote, Every person of every race possesses full dignity and is worthy of respect and Christian love. Every person is worthy of respect and love. As John will later say, you cannot love God and hate your brother. Favoritism is an act of selfishness. It's not an act of love. I heard a quote recently, and the guy was talking about marriage, so we have to import this into what we're talking about here. But he said, the greatest indicator of, of a mature love is not romance, but selflessness. Now, how true is that in marriage? Well, likewise, what, 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 I, what is James saying? I think James is saying this is one of the greatest indicators of neighbor love. is selflessness. is a thought towards those that, that, that may not be like us, others that we would look at and, and maybe not even consider as we should. James says every neighbor you come in contact with, do you love them as you would love yourself? Do you treat others as you would want to be treated? You say, well, there's a lot of issues that comes into relationships and people. Issues of safety and experiences and baggage and upbringing and ignorance and miscommunication and all of that can be true. But my friends, of all the issues that impact our relationships, remember, the greatest of these is love. Neighbor love is risky sometimes. Neighbor love is bold. Neighbor love is vulnerable. Neighbor love will make you uncomfortable. And while neighbor love is not always the easiest thing to do, James says it is the right thing to do. Love your neighbor. Who are those neighbors you have a hard time getting along with? They might be literal neighbors in your neighborhood. There might be people around you this morning that you don't, you just don't click. James says love them. Because favoritism is a sin against love. In verses 9 to 11, he also said it's a sin against the law. It's a sin against the law. Now you can imagine somebody saying, well, come on, James, you're just, phew, you're just blowing this out of proportion. Come on, it's tacky to show favoritism, but it's not that big of a deal. And James says, oh, really? Let me show you just how big of a deal it is, verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You can't get any more clear than that. James hits the nail on the head. You're violating a fundamental rule of God's Word. He says this is not some obscure footnote in the Old Testament. You say, wait a minute, it was Leviticus. They knew Leviticus much better than we did, all right? That was not obscure. 
And James is saying here, we, this was repeated over and over again, that God expects us to do this. And when you go against this, you're knowingly and willingly, he said, violating God's law. So look at what he says in verse 10, And whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Imagine dangling from a building and the only thing that you have to hold on to is a, is a chain. And imagine as you're holding on to that, one of the chains break. James's point is, you didn't just break the one link. You broke the whole chain. And it's no small thing to break the whole chain. James is saying, don't realize the, the, the impact of this. Now, some will say, wait a minute, aren't some sins worse than others? And in one sense, yes, Jesus made the distinction of the weightier matters of the law. And some sins are worse in terms of impact and results, but they are not worse in terms of guilt. That's James's point. My kids were were talking about this, and I said, let me put it to you this way. I said, what's the difference of somebody who takes one tiny step off the top of the Sears Tower and somebody else who runs and jumps and does a backflip? The difference between, you know, gravity and guilt, the, the result's the same. That's, it. That's his point here. It doesn't matter if it's a small violation or a big one. You are guilty before God himself. And then notice verse 11. He says, For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, then you've become a transgressor of the law. Now, here's what's interesting. I don't think James is necessarily saying that, that he's putting prejudice and murder on the same Uh, plain in in, in every situation. I think what he's saying is actually kind of nuanced, but I think what he's saying is this. His point is, you don't get to overlook one sin simply because you haven't committed a worse sin. James is saying you don't balance out some of your bad by doing some good. It's not like, well, I get to break these three commandments because I kept these seven. James is saying, no, 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 that's not how this works. To use as James's own analogy here, imagine a man on murder for trial. And the judge says, how do, what, what is your defense? And the man says, well, judge, I, I know you got video evidence and DNA and all these other things that would say I'm guilty, but I think I'm innocent. And he says, why? He says, because I've never committed adultery. I've never cheated on my wife. And what would the judge say? What has that got to do with it? That, that has no relationship to this. James is saying you you shouldn't make yourself feel better about doing this bad thing because you do all these other good things. If you are guilty of breaking the law of love, you are guilty, period. What does this sound like today? I think for some, the the modern version of this is the Christian who says, "I I don't care about racism and equality because I care about abortion. Sin is not multiple choice both are a violation of god's word and we are to oppose them james says to break one point is to be guilty of the whole thing james says we have one law which comes from one lawgiver and we're not called to 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 rank them he says we are to not just obey the ones that we find easier or more palatable he says we are to completely obey the full will and word of god and that includes love your neighbor as yourself james's final point here is that favoritism is also a sin not only against christ and the church and god and neighbor, and love, and law, it is also a sin against mercy. It is a sin against mercy. James saves his exclamation point for the end. What what should you do? James says in verse 12, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Notice those two verbs there. Speak and act. This is where favoritism shows up for us. It shows up in our words oftentimes, in our actions. And instead of ugly favoritism shaping our speech and actions, he says you need to see to it that beautiful mercy is what shapes your words and your actions. In verse 13 he says, For judgment will be merciless to to the one who has shown no mercy. I think he's speaking there about judgment day. That one day we will all stand before God and give an account for our words and our actions. 
Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That is, on the day of judgment. He says they are to prove themselves, to show their love and their kindness, and not sin against it. And then he concludes in verse 13, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Those who show mercy to others will escape the final judgment. Now you say, wait a minute, that sounds like works-based salvation. That sounds like I need to do something to be saved. I don't think that's what James is saying here. James is not saying that we are saved because of our kindness to others. James is saying those who show mercy prove that they have already received mercy themselves. Tim Keller says it this way, mercy is not the duty of a Christian, it is the mark of a Christian. He's not calling us to moralism. He is saying, remember the unmerited favor of God that He showed to you when you were an enemy, when when you were on the other side, when you were an outcast, when, when you were one that was on the other side of God, He says, and yet God loved you, God chose you, God saved you. He showed His grace to you in that. You didn't deserve it, but you He showed it to you. The gospel is clear that all have sinned and come short of God's glory. And Titus 2 says the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. He's talking in Titus 2 about to old men and young men and old women and young women and to slaves and free. He's saying God has showered His grace and showered His love and showered His gospel to all men and all women that walk the, the, the planet. And we should too. We should copy that pattern of mercy that has been shown to us. My friends, the good news of the end of verse 13, that mercy triumphs over judgment, James is reminding us that when Christ came to earth, He came to show mercy, and yet in the end He received judgment. And we are the ones who deserve judgment, but because of Christ, we we receive mercy. This is not just moralism. He's saying you you put the the beauty of the gospel on display by showing grace and kindness and mercy to others. It reminds me of the end of Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Remember Scrooge's transformation? I'm not saying Dickens is the gospel, but but there is a picture in what he says here. Remember what, what happens? The last three pages, Scrooge changes dramatically. Why? Because he woke up in his bed and realized it wasn't judgment day and that he still had an opportunity to live differently. And so he goes, and out of gratitude, out of sheer excitement for what he had received, in that case a second chance, he then lavished out of joy on Bob Cratchit and others. My friends, that's what James is calling us to. Who are the neighbors that we have a hard time loving as we should? James says, loving others is not a chore, it is an opportunity to put the gospel on display. So we come back to my original question. Would this passage have made a difference on March 8, 1961? Answer is, I don't know. I hope so. But we can't change the past. But what we can do is let James to evaluate our own hearts and our own favoritisms and our own prejudices and our own discriminations, and make a difference in us in 2020. In 1961, Forest Baptist Church was wrong. Let's make sure that in 2020 and in the years ahead, we do what is right and always love our neighbors as ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for this passage in James that, that searches our hearts. And Lord, gets down to the the nitty-gritty of life. And so, Lord, we come first and foremost asking that you would you'd forgive us of our favoritisms. Lord, forgive us of not showing mercy. Forgive us, Lord, of showing bias and prejudice. Lord, cleanse our hearts of those temptations and those sins. Lord, we know that, that, that we all carry that temptation in us. We pray that you'd give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart of compassion like Jesus to love and to show mercy and grace and kindness. And Lord, may we be ambassadors of Christ Himself who was rich 
and yet for our sakes became poor, so that through faith in Him we might become rich in Him. May we bring that good news to the needy and lost around us, and may we show the world something that is different, not strife and not division, but unity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, O Lord, towards that end, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it.